little kid to all the islands, you know. The reason why we kept these uh, skills is, as we already talked about, it's the resources. We have very limited resources in our island, so we need to travel from place to place to get what we need. So, in 1985, out of eighth grade elementary school, I was one of the youngest sailor from Hawaii to Tahiti. And that's the voyage of rediscovery. I believe some of these uh, best navigators from the South Pacific joined that voyage because it goes through the uh, triangle of Malaysia. Uh, 1984, I was also trained with some of these navigators from the Polynesian Islands. That's Tuwa and uh, Chaco, Filipi, and all those, of course, how to prepare for the voyage 95 to all the Tahitian Islands. And that's the sharing of caring. You know, when you sail on a canoe, it's all about a family, a voyaging family. So we did our voyage in 1995 down to the island. We're supposed to meet up with all the canoes from different places, but some, some are not ready in time. So we're able to sail with Te Aurere from New Zealand, uh, Takitumu, if I'm not mistaken, from Cook Island, and uh, Te Aotonga. That's the Cook Island's canoes. So we're able to sail with another three canoes from Hawaii, Hukulea, Makali, and Hawaii Loa. So we did our tribute to the islands of uh, Tahiti, to uh, Marquesas, back to Hawaii. And that's when I met all these navigators that they were trained by uh, my father. And then they were able to made it to settle out to, to went through the uh, post ceremony to become a great navigator. So sailing is about caring of our culture, our resources, and in terms of all this, what needs to be done for a young generation to come. Again, I'd like to thank all of you Sarah had, had asked uh, uh, Dr. Patrick Kelly to speak a little bit about the, uh, the Voyaging Society. Thank you and uh, good morning. I, uh, Seth uh, has made a presentation and it's only fair and fitting that when a navigator tells the college president to come and speak, I have to come and speak. Because I can, I can be here for the, the, the rest of my life, I probably will not be able to gain the knowledge that he has. And I've uh, gained a lot of uh, respect. Uh, the only introduction I had to his family was when uh, Mao sailed, sailed regularly to Palau and then especially to Malagao. Those who are not familiar with uh, Palau, there are two kingdoms in Palau. One is Koror and one is Malagao. And that's why the capital of Palau is in Malagao, because for 200 years, when people came in, they announced to the world that the center of the universe in Palau is Koror. So the constitutional framers of our constitution would wanted to correct that balance and move it to Malaga, where the seat of the government is. And that's where he made the regular uh, voyage. In fact, he named the, uh, oh, where did Dylan go? The, the older, the, the younger, uh, second oldest son, Cesar, you have made that first uh, sail, and I just, my heart just almost sank when they arrived, and there's a young kid. And then uh, about 70 days ago, when I, we were at the, the departure point, and then uh, Cesar, you said Dylan was going, and I was more comfortable with was man, and everybody was there. But I think we're, we're very grateful. 
Yeah, I think that's the one, and then uh, we have a point there. I know I'm between you and Lan, so I'm just going to go quickly. This is Maisu. These are the people, and this is the young man that we have a viewing for tomorrow. And in the room, uh, we have a... Uh, which one is the... Okay, so that's uh, Cesario, that's Dylan. Dylan, raise your hand, please. There. And then Albino is in the canoe. Miano is in the canoe, Norman's in the canoe. Eileen is here, Eileen, can you please raise your hand, we recognize. Uh, Ms. Hayashi is here, there, she's in the back. Now, of course, uh, Rodney would like to go back, but by tradition, he needs to go with me with the body back to Palau, cut short our festival participation, we need to go back. This is the, what we did to explain to our community, and some of you have this brochure, if you don't have, we'll give it to you. We omitted some of the islands, I apologize for that, but uh, we have uh, provided, uh, we have made a correction and we'll make it available. This is kind of brief history, Cesario has gone through that. They went to the islands and of course they came and ended up in Palau. 2007 is uh, IMC, the welcoming uh, uh, ceremony when Hokulea and Maisu arrived in Palau. We'll see some pictures later and that started uh, what uh, came about as uh, Micronesian Voyaging Society. By the way, in the brochure it says I'm a member, I'm not a member of the society, Sassario is a member of the society. This is its charter, the government of Palau. And uh, these are the members of society, so just to make sure we get things done, we're to Paramount Chiefs in Palau, they're members, the president, Salo Matkison, former minister, Alan C. Tactoriano, and uh, of course, uh, Cesario. Uh, this, all of, some of these members got on the plane, came to Guam behind the scenes to find out that everything is just fine for the uh, taking care of uh, the young men to go back. So we took care of that. We appreciate those who saw us and were with us at Adap when we had to bring the wife and the daughter to to go and see his and uh, collect his belongings from the boat. <coughs> the, the, the daughter bought, uh, boarded the plane, arrived in Guam, stayed in the hotel, wanted to surprise the father when he stepped off the land. And then we had, before that, we have to scramble to tell her that uh, it would not be as easy as she thought it would be. Or just uh, about uh, Maisu. Same thing, it's just a quote from uh, Nainoa. This is uh, Maisu under construction. Uh, this is Papa Mao. Uh, the only other connection I have with him, we both received our degrees at the same time. Myself, a meager bachelor's degree at UH and him a doctorate at the University of Hawaii. Anybody here remember when they went to present the hood to him? I don't remember that graduation, and he said, you know, you, you cannot put that over his head. That was really, it was hilarious, and the whole stadium didn't understand why, and they, maybe they should not understand. Some just scenes of him, these are from the tribute that the government of people of Palau, when they did a tribute to Mao, uh, used. This is the arrival in 2007, uh, Hukulea and uh, and that was the reason for all the work canoes in Palau to go out. You see, there were like nine of them. And see, this is when we start how Palau Community College got involved in this thing. Because it's, you know, it's easier said than done. We needed to institutionalize the system. That's what we did. So Cesario is a navigator, but he has a family, he has wife and kids, and he needs to have a home, a car, he needs to have a job. So he's a full-time, employee of the college. Accreditation calls for not bestowing him a professorship, but once with Dr. Underwood. Yes, we, I was at the graduation once we start giving those masters and doctoral degrees, then, the, then we will bestow those titles. Uh, okay, so of course that's him. That's a few years ago, says. And this is uh, uh, one of his students, uh, 
from, I think, Alaska again, which is kind of work and put it together. So I just wanted to, I'm just quickly doing this so that later on you can uh, come and get, uh, talk to him. He needs to answer all the questions. We have our own uh, Vianglis uh, canoe house in Pula. We have seven different uh, canoes uh, inside there. Uh, see the sails all blue and gold. That's a Palawan uh, thing. So we take them out and Cesario has been instrumental in teaching. We have, uh, this is just uh, paddling and then we have work canoes. This is one of the scenes, I don't know when. These are the voyages. We do an annual event. Hopefully at the end of this summit, you'll join us in uh, because we do an annual thing. So, Palau Yap, Palau Mulu, Mulu Yap, Palau Sonsorol, uh, Palau Saipan, and all things. And we will do it every year. These are most of the, all the voids that Cesario uh, puts through. Sometimes they help uh, uh, motorized vehicles or motorized speedboats. Uh, for instance, the governor of Sonsorol, 300 miles, wants to go on his twin 250 horsepower. He can go only one way and he doesn't have fuel to come back, there's no gas station, so Cess would sail and dump drums of fuel so the governor can sail there and then burn the fossil fuel back. And then one day uh, somebody came and said, I need to go to Yap on a speedboat and uh, ask him to show him the way to Yap. And uh, that evening I called uh, Mrs. and I said, where's uh, Cess? Uh, we're supposed to go out fishing. I said, oh, I'm sorry, President. Cesario went to show the way to Yap, so they left already. So. You know, this is, I put this picture because it is important. You know, we have gone through this, uh, I went through that and uh, opening ceremony. I also, I was also at the back, that's me. Well, that's a U.S. Uh, ambassador, CRC, U.S. Coast Guard and this is something about when the Mysore took water on one. We, we later soon found out that it was not a whole problem. The water came from the top. They figured it out. But when uh, they took water at 2.30 a.m., listen to this. He took water at 2.30 a.m. I told him, why didn't you call me? And he said, oh, I looked at the clock and you were still sleeping. But the canoe is underwater, and he wants to wait for me until I wake up at 7 the next morning. <laughs> so, just, but anyway, to make the long story short, uh, we made all those connections. And there's a Rai Balang. A Rai Balang uh, is like a marine surveillance operation where FSM and Palau and U.S. Coast Guard are working. So the closest ship uh, was dispatched. Uh, Hyundai Unity, which had three, for 3,000 containers. Uh, went and then pulled them and wait for a postcard cutter. So by the time I got the call at 6.30, so when we welcome them at the dock, it's 7.30 in the evening. That's how long it took. And then the next day we went and found the canoe, brought it in, repaired it, and back to square one. That's the voyage. This is uh, what he told me. He said, okay, uh, people want to know where the voyage, so this is how Cesario works this thing out. Just so I just show how he does this thing which island, when do they live, when do they... And of course we need to provision the canoe. We do fundraising, uh, the college does. And these are all the scenes from uh, the departure ceremony. Uh, some, uh, somebody was there, so this guy. We were very happy, thank you. That's uh, Bilum uh, uh, from uh, Palau. He was there to see them off. Uh, that's uh, Rodney, and of course, oh, you're there in the picture too. That's the president of Palau right there, uh, sending them off. And then, uh, since it was the opening of Palau's participation at the Festival of Arts, the dancers have to send them off. This is the dance that we uh, uh, eliminated that morning uh, after consulting with the delegation. And those who are going to the bay tonight, uh, all of you guys are invited to the bay. You will be able to see that dance uh, at uh, Palawan Bay. Sorry, I don't know the community. Somewhere along the dedo, there's two Palawan Bay over there, and there's a host uh, inner over there. These are probably, I'm not sure, are these new pictures or previous voyages? Previous voyages. So uh, this is uh, Ailey and the previous voyages. And this is, these are probably new when they were departing. This is the first picture that was trimmed out of CNMI. 
when they arrive to Saipan, they see smiling off. Thank you, Congressman Tupatep, and everyone who welcomed them. And then, of course, Papa Mao, Horizon, thank you. Mario is, um, is also, uh, besides being traditionally trained, he's also a, um, a photographer and a uh, camera person. Mario was our uh, camera man when we shot uh, our documentary, Sacred Vessels, in 1996. And Mario is, is actually something of a, an ambassador and a liaison person between the Polowat community and the folks from the Marianas that has been really important in many different um, um, cultural exchange exchanges. The, um, with, speaking with Mario is, uh, is um, Kyoko Miyazawa. Kyoko Miyazawa is also a, um, a, a journalist, a photojournalist, and uh, documentary producer and camera person with Studio Umi in Japan. Um, she, uh, the work that she's done across Asia and the Pacific is amazing, documenting traditional culture, especially maritime culture. Um, I won't read where she's been, she's been everywhere, including, uh, I, 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 I want to mention, uh, many places in Indonesia and Southeast Asia. Um, uh, Miyazawa was also very uh, instrumental in helping with Dr. Goto and, and our colleagues from Japan in getting a, um, a traditional canoe built from the beginning to the end, all, all local materials, all traditional tools for documentary purposes, and then getting that transported by sail and ship to the Okinawa uh, Oceanic Culture Museum. So Mario and uh, Yoko. Sirowami uh, uh, First of all, I think my, my voice cannot allow me to speak. Because, you know, like in our culture, my older brother is sitting over here, my uncles are sitting over there. And in our culture, they're supposed to be the one that, you know, like talk about, you know, like uh, about the uh, uh, navigation skills. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the pictures or the exhibition of the <coughs> Oceanic Culture Museum in Okinawa. Uh, I'm sorry that I'm not navigator. I'm not Thailand born <laughs> woman, but uh, I'm here because of the two canoes. One is Chechemeni, the canoe from uh, canoe that sailed to Okinawa from, from Satawa to Okinawa in <coughs> early 75. I watched the documentary movie and I, it inspired me a lot. It, I found that the, the visual documentation is very important and meaningful. And since then, I dream to have a, to, to make a documentary by myself. And uh, 
The other, the other canoe is the Empolo one. The canoe that we made together with the Polowat communities and also the help of the Tasi members on Guam and uh, thanks to the museum, we could make it. And uh, uh, so the, now the story behind the Lien Polowat back started in 2005 when I got to know Master Navigator Mani Sikao. We talked a lot and found this, that we have the same dream. Many also wish to make a visual documentation for, as a gift to future generations and also to his people of island, especially kids. So uh, we tried to find the chance. And finally got the uh, chance to start the project supported by the museum. So, um, and uh, many wanted to show the power, knowledge, and skills of tiny coral islands and coral islands in Micronesia to the world. So the, because we decided to build a canoe, sailing canoe from the beginning, we plan to document a uh, whole process. And we decided to challenge to use the traditional skills as much as possible, only with manpower, without any electricity and also all the materials available on the island, even the paint, we made a uh, black, you know, like a mangrove-like plant, and also the soil. So, um, actually, actually, what we, you guys know, like use on the pollock, is all the materials are uh, local. It, it's being weaving and uh, making ropes. Everything is uh, local or made. And also, uh, we wanted to film around the canoe cause, because the canoe is not just like a transportation tools, but it is really an um, important part of their, their culture. Uh, wa. Canoe is called in their language wa. And that means vein in the human body. Vein that keeps uh, people healthy, bring circulate, blood, circulate, circulate in, yeah. So, you know, uh, so, yeah, this is, you know, like the uh, lively uh, style living in Polowat. We go out, we fish. Kids, you know, like when they were still young, they, they battle around the lagoon. Just to, just to feel, just to learn how to battle and how to live on the water. And uh, there's the, like, the day uh, practice, we go on, we fish, we will bring back to the family. That's why we call it wa, wahara. Means, you know, like the, the vessel in your, in your body that carry blood from your heart to your body. So before I further, I'm gonna uh, invite my uncle over here to speak more because you know, like my voice is not really uh, keeping me uh, <laughs> side. Salutation of admiration and respect to all the uh, seafarers who are present here and to all the high-ranking populations of the higher political and cultural echelon from all the entities across the city who happens to be here. I'm very fortunate. Here with a great surge of emotion, pride, and humility to stand in front of you. But I'm just being obedient to what my person asked me to do. Uh, if, I, if I can have this Kiego to go ahead and roll the picture so I can uh, talk about some of the aspects of canoe carving on the island of Polo. 
One particular part that I want to focus on is the EWA. Itawa, by the way, is the drawing, making a drawing and reading the medium of the knot which you make out of the coconut leaves to determine who will be the first person to execute the first strike at the determined route facing the determined direction, whether it be absolute or relative or the main direction or the intermediate direction. I think they have a part in this video that display that spiritual part. If I can just have Miss Kibble click to that, you, you don't have it? It's, it it's at the beginning when they talk to you, I mean, the screen, the carbon. Anyway, this is uh, something that cannot be grasped by the scope of cognitive analysis because part of this process is beyond scientific curiosity, actually. I mean, it cannot be subjected to the interpretation of objective investigation. So to speak. I mean, it's beyond the scope of all the scrutiny of the five sensory personality. I heard Prince talking about the many uh, senses that are now discovered. As I think they've been discovered all along by those who have people with this knowledge and pass it on down to us, the younger generation. Actually, this knowledge has not come from, has come from a mysterious tale that came down from the vicinity of the East, namely Aral, means rock. On the southbound of the freeway, Koran worked her way down to the vicinity of the west. But it eventually returned. And when it gets to this island in a modern day Punbei state in the Everson called Ngajik or Ingarik, it right off in the space, lifted off. And like he was mentioning that long before that renowned Renaissance artist Leonardo da Vinci have reconceived the idea that man is capable to divide gravitational law by mathematic, I mean, gravitational force by mathematical law, Koran, the one one leader, are already known in this space. Not by the spell of magic, not by the calculated action of physics, but by the authentic power derived from the very entity of the force field of mysterium that operates beyond the scope and the scope of our understanding. Uh, this may be sounds boisterous, but please leave aside your scientific inclination trying to accept what we're talking about from a cultural standpoint. Is that all right, please? Okay, I'll do it to you. And as you see here, the, all the ropes are made from coconut fibers no nylon ropes were used. <clears throat> and this is the, we call it yong, it's like a mangrove-like plant. And uh, we extract the, how to say it? They that. actually scrape the skin off to squeeze the juice out of it, the sand. Mix it with uh, the charcoal to paint the canoe with. That's the uh, local paint. So we put the, they put the young by their hands, and uh, this black part is the one. And uh, that is how we, we filmed on the land, and I filmed on the emperor world. This is the key uh, uh, outrigger. The two poles connecting the main hall with the outrigger. Uh, this is Tam, Tam uh, float. Mm -hmm. This is 
Fan. Fan. This is what they call bottom, the sanctuary. It is where the Fanino from the wrong friend master. I think this is where you navigate a system to administer all the necessary rituals prior to departure and at the point of departure and at the point of arrival to your destiny. All the spirituality of the whole art of navigation is taking place here. This is where they can read the wave notes, they can redirect the uh, current, direction of the current, certain things that can be actually influenced by that authentic power vested in the navigator. Now that leads up to another avenue of consideration, but since I cannot overshot the time limitation, it's been said, I think, <laughs> confined, it's confined. <laughs> The steering, Fatulabu. Fatulabu, the rudder, the steering, yes. On their way to the Turtle Islands, which is called Pigalo, <coughs> it's located in the eastern part of the F state. It is about 570 miles or something like, quite like that. I cannot be very definite on the exact between Pig and Guam, but it's close to that. This is a paddle, and this is a, what we call ma. The prow, the prow, how they make the prow, to the small it on. The, the prow is in the finality process. <coughs> put on, what, what it's uh, the design, the de desired design, the desired look. So beside the canoe construction, uh, the master navigator Teo Onope allowed us to film the rituals that uh, related to the construction and the sailing. This is the primal as well as the primordial aspects of local navigation. Uh, navigators, by the way, are priests. Now, those of you who are Catholics, you know what I mean. Uh, here, the master navigator will have his crew sit in circle, encompassed by these plants, and he will light the torch to absolve the sailors of their iniquities and transgressions. Cleanse their life, empowering them. This is actually, in Christian terms, the general absolution. To ward off any evil is a thing that they pointed their way to frustrate the plan of the voyage and to shield them off from ailments and all that. And not only before they leave, but they, it can be administered. If I'm not wrong, I will refer that to this navigator. Uh, okay. They can administer it prior to the departure, and if they see that their sailors are not feeling good, the master navigator do the absolution. But usually, yes, it's one of the spiritual aspects of uh, local navigation. So, friends, actually, navigation and kilo carving, I see them as elaborating the complexity of rituals and sacredness that I don't quite understand it. So I'd like to learn it, and I want to be an advocate of them, afraid of the water. <laughs> so we, after this ceremony, we started sailing to Guam, and uh, after Guam, we had to assemble the part of the canoe to put in the container to send it to Okinawa. Even though we wanted to continue sailing to Okinawa, the Japanese government authorities didn't allow us. But it was lucky I could witness how they dis disassemble and reassemble properly in short times. It, is, it seems like I saw uh, when something happened on the sea, they know how to repair in properly in so even though we, all of us wanted to continue sailing, uh, I took this experience as positive that they showed us how the, uh, the skills of re maintenance, repairing, 
also. So this is in the Okinawa, the part of the Korean Polo World. And we started the, uh, reassembling in the museum's exhibition site. And it's going to be Savior uh, Sylvia Sacrament of who we are as Pacific and Sea Ferris. That's one commonality we share. We may have come across from across a trackless Pacific, but we are Sea Ferris. And let's keep that. As someone was saying that we are Pacificans, we live by the water, we depend solely on the water, and we stay that way amid the hurries and triviality of the impact of transculturation, which had have been hampering our society ever since the uh, willing guys come and have the chance of on the people of our islands. Uh, I need you to come cut me out. Anyway, thank you, please. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great honor and a great pleasure also to be standing here among you, uh, master navigators, crew members, and uh, friends of the Pacific. Uh, it's really humbling, and I would like to thank you for giving me this, this opportunity to represent my community and um, our uh, society back uh, in Tahiti. Uh, our little presentation here is, is really short, actually. Um, but before, I would like to acknowledge uh, all the people who have uh, been sailing and sharing their knowledge. Uh, I'd like to start with, of course, uh, late. Uh, uh, because without him, uh, I wouldn't be standing here in front of you. Also, all the crew members and, and captains and navigators of Hokulea, uh, Te Aotonga, and uh, the navigators of Rarotonga, thanks to them that we have our canoe today. Wafaite. Wafaite Te Omaohi. We are part of this big family called Pacific Voyages or we have different names, but anyway, we're part of this big network that uh, um, came to be in 2009. And since then, we've sailed together. We went to Hawaii in 2011. Uh, we also went around the Pacific all the way to the Solomon Island four years ago during the, the last uh, Pacific Art Festival. Um, that's okay. I think if you can't work it out, it's all right. It's just too bad. <laughs> um, and so we've been doing uh, a lot of sailing together, and now all those wakas, all those wa are, are doing their own work in their own countries. Um, so what we've been doing back in Tahiti since then is basically trying to revive this knowledge that was lost, unfortunately for us, uh, be just because navigation and sailing was uh, prohibited uh, about two centuries ago. And, and as you know, uh, the same was done for our language and all, pretty much all, that, all of our indigenous science. But today there's a big movement and we're trying to revive and to leave all, all of those values basically. And one of the main things is, and that was said before, is to reconnect with the ocean. And Fa'afaite, which is the name of our society, and also of our waka uh, means reconciliation. And so today, we need to reconnect and reconciliate ourselves with our tupuna, our culture, our ocean, our inuwa. Um, because without that connection, we are just anybody. We, we, we're nobody, pretty much. And so that's what we try to do with uh, sailing. So we try not to sail just for fun. And I think that's one of the challenges that we face today is that a lot of people back home think that sailing uh, sounds pretty romantic or there's a myth behind it and it's fun and but there's also people who think that it's needed it's a challenge uh, and that it, we also know that sailing uh, can lead to greater things so the va'a, the canoe is a catalyst to do many many other things like reviving our language, uh, reviving our connection, like I said, to the ocean and trying to learn again uh, uh, and read the ocean, read the, the elements around you because we don't do that, unfortunately, back home, uh, especially on the island I'm from, on Tahiti, on the main island. It's uh, uh, 
basically the urban place. And a lot of people forget that they come from the Mona Nui. And it's really sad. But there's a lot of other organizations such as our society who are today, and it's been ongoing for a few years now, who are um, doing their job, doing their work in the field <laughs> and trying to to sell and, and relearn, regain that knowledge. And I'd like also to acknowledge uh, Tua Pittman, who's here, because he's uh, one of the pole navigators who uh, has been helping us a lot. He's actually sailed on Vofaite a few times. And also Matua Hotulua, who's here. Uh, and with all those connections with the Hawaiians as well, we've been doing, um, we've been, we've been helping, and we, we've been doing what we do today. A lot of, a lot of the vision uh, actually was given from, from them. So today is uh, it's it's uh, it's a pleasure to be here. But uh, it's also I didn't want to talk actually in front of you. I was really intimidated. But it's also reviving to me and it's inspiring. All the talk that you've been saying uh, that's just boosting me a lot. And I can't wait to go back home and share this with our people. Because one, one of the things that we tend to forget is that um, you know, there are a lot of challenges, but we need to overcome them in order to exist, in order to pass down that knowledge and that way of life. Somebody once told me that you know, in 2008, before we actually started, before we put our feet, our two feet into this, what I used to call a project, uh, somebody told me, and she's like, maybe some of you know her, she's uh, the, the daughter of the late uh, Po Navigator, Clay Bredman, uh, Po Mai. She said, if you're going to do it, Matahi, don't look at it as a project. But be sure, make sure that you, you, you do it and, and as a lifestyle. You have to commit. And so sailing, navigation, it, it is all about that. It's a lifestyle, not just a hobby. And that's a big challenge, I guess, for us to try to put that in people's mind, uh, especially the young people back home. But we're getting there. Um, so it's too bad because Danny has beautiful pictures uh, to show. <laughs> it's okay. okay. I know we have a lot of, uh, few, only a few minutes still. Uh, so Danny maybe will, since he's here, we'll talk about the other uh, canoe projects because we don't, we're not the only one back home and we would also like to acknowledge them. Thank you. Uh, yeah, in Tahiti here, what we're doing is uh, we're teaching navigational workshops to the elementary schools and the high schools. Uh, and also, there's other projects going on. Um, there's a man in Rangiroa called Punua who's building a double hole canoe and also is teaching uh, the children and everything in the, in the schools about the navigation and the canoe. Also in Fakarava, in the Tumoto Atolls, uh, there's another canoe that uh, they're building, and it's, uh, they're doing it, uh, what, what's that called? Uh, okay, yeah. and, and also there's uh, Holopuni, which is another sailing type of vessel uh, that is very, getting very popular uh, in Tahiti. Um, I've been on many voyages and everything from Hawaii to the Solomon Islands. And I uh, also did a field research in Taiwan. And I just wanted to say that everything that I've, I've seen uh, on the different islands that we voyaged to um, was very, very similar. And i just like to say that uh, the Pacific is basically one big family, but separated by political boundaries. Uh, what I've seen is we're all one. And that's my closing statement that I'd like to say. Thank you. So, do, are we still good or? Yep. <laughs> this is too bad. Danny has been helping us a lot since the beginning. And, and one, the other thing that's, that's important um, is that we document. Uh, we try to document as much as we, we do. And uh, because, you know, and, don't be offended, but I didn't know there were so many wow, so many canoes here in Micronesia before I actually saw you guys coming in the harbor. Uh, I think today, because I'm a journalist also, actually, this is my main purpose here. 
uh, is to document what's happening here. It's really important to get the word out and to put this into the mainstream media to talk about us, talk about what we do, even the little projects, because uh, we've been getting a lot of you know, things and, and, and uh, the media uh, is really focused on, the, on Europe, on, um, on the US, even back home, and so much that we forget that we are brothers and sisters just around the Pacific. And, and I think, well, that's basically one of our goals, Danny and I, is to document, to talk about what we do, the Va'a culture. And uh, yeah, we try to, um, to make more people aware uh, of you, of us, of whatever is happening around. Because uh, I think we have a lot to, to share, but also a lot to tell to the world, especially regarding preservation of, of our oceans. Yeah, oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, we can start with that. So yeah, one of our, the vision I was telling you, uh, we get really, we are really, really lucky to know a lot of people in the Pacific. Uh, I myself was in first, plea, f first time introduced to Va'a with uh, the Makali'i Ohana, Makali Va'a or Hawaii, and their philosophy is based on Heva'a, Hemoku, Hemoku, Heva'a, which translates into the canoe is our island. Our island is, is a canoe, and uh, this is part of the lifestyle uh, I was t telling you about. If we, if we, when we sail out, we take care of our canoe, and this is something you, you know, I don't, I'm not teaching you anything, but it's something we try to transpose into our daily lives on land as well. The objectives of our modern va'a, unlike the fishermen, unlike uh, our ancestors, they used to, to sail, uh, and like you said earlier, um, to, because we care about their people. It was a matter of life, of survivor, of survival. Uh, today, we, we do that not to survive, but in some way to, to pass down all those values. So I was telling, telling you about uh, Tua Pitman, and also Kalipa Baibayan, who's another poor navigator who help, helped us uh, sailing. Uh, one thing that we do differently maybe than the other, say, uh, yacht clubs or, or sailing, um, like sailors, European sailors, is that we learn as we do. We cannot learn in books only, and that this is true for everybody. And this is a, uh, um, a proverb, a Maori proverb, that I really, uh, I really liked. It's kore uti a kaware ware. You correct me if I say it right. Fakatumi a kamahara, fakamahi a kamuhia. So when I read it, I forget. When I see it, I remember. But when I do it, I know it. So part of our philosophy, part of our, um, the way we teach and to learn is actually to include everybody, to include them in what we do, especially the young ones. A uh, picture of a, a girl in the middle of guys. So Fafaite has a lot of girls, crew members, and we're lucky to have that. And intergeneration, uh, the, that has to be a family thing. So this is, by the way, uh, Hoturoa and Turona. Uh, son and, and, uh, and father, that's really inspiring uh, picture. Um, yeah. cool. So talking to, to you about challenges, it has to become a lifestyle. And you guys know that uh, a va'a, any va'a, needs a community around it because otherwise it dies. It just, that's it. If you have a, one, one guy or just a, a few people, eventually you'll burn and, and the, the va'a will just sit on the, the beach and die. Uh, so we need to maintain that community as well. Personal sacrifices, we all have families and unfortunately, it cannot be just a lifestyle, like navigators used to, to do that all their lives since they are youngsters and we need to go to school now. I mean, we have that frame, or tra frame of you know, the westernized frame. We need to pay the bills, finance, you know, family lives whenever we sell for two, three months, it's, it has a toll on the families. So these are the challenges we, we face too back home. And um, finances is a big thing. Uh, and, and we have to, to keep balance between making business with our canoes and actually living um, and sailing the way our ancestors used to do. So it's a fine line and we try really to be careful with that uh, because we need the money, it costs about anything between 20,000 to 30,000 uh, US dollar 
just on the regular maintenance per year. Uh, on our, and I'm talking about our communities, this is, uh, you, I'm not even talking about the other costs of changing sales and whatnot. That's, so, yeah. It's a picture of uh, uh, some of the workshop we do with the, the schools and also the, the young children. Uh, we try to implement that in our schooling system. So, thank you. That, that's, uh, that was us. <laughs> Thank you for listening to us. Uh, we're very honored to be here. We, uh, we uh, were invited uh, by um, Dr. Larry Cunningham to make a proposal to, um, to, uh, that we thought was an important um, topic to address. Uh, I, uh, Soro, Soro, Ami, uh, we do not have a formal presentation because we, we only saw each other yesterday to get ready. Ali has been sailing from Lamatrak with uh, two other canoes. So, um, but we do have stories to tell. And um, let's see, we don't have the whole Ed Talk thing there. Let's, we need to see this start compass. So, how many people don't know what GPS is? Raise your hand. Good. Uh, I know there's several navigators here who know and already practice the ETOC system of navigation, wayfinding. In uh, Lamatrek, it goes by a different name. It's Hatak. The dialectical shift from Lamatrek to Sadawal to Puluat. Uh, changes so that the term etok is uh, really comes from Puluwat and Sadawal. But on Lamatrek and the islands toward Yap, it's called Hatak. The reason why it's known as etok is because the first anthropologist who described it was a German in 1909 who was part of the Erge Business Desutze expedition, 1908-1910. And he visited Puluat, and he was the first one, as far as I know, to describe it in detail. So that's why it's called Etak. It's a uh, dead reckoning system, very difficult to learn. I've been sailing with my brother from Lamatrek since 1977. I keep returning to go back to uh, learn more. And like Vince said, uh, I was very interested in uh, navigational heritage in the Central Carolines to the point where his father, the Grand Master Jesus Yurupi, he resurrected it in 1990. Before that, Mao Pilug went through the Po on Sadawal in around 1951 or 52. In talking with Mao, I remember he couldn't really remember, but it was, it hadn't been done since 1951 or 52, until Yurpi, Ali's father, resurrected it in 1990. And I filmed it and uh, you mentioned Spirits of the Voyage. That is the documentation. I'm an ethnographic filmmaker, also an educational anthropologist from California. Um, so what Ali is going to do is try and tell you what it is because it's an endangered system of dead reckoning, we call it dead reckoning. Basically, Westerners are used to a two-dimensional map. You know, you go from one point to another point, and you chart the course, two dimensions. But as David Lewis wrote in uh, his book, We the Navigators and Voyaging Stars, the ETOC system is a polydimensional system. Very difficult to, for Westerners to understand because it's a different cognitive process. And the best way to understand it is to go into a planetarium and pretend you're on a boat. And that's what Mao did. David Lewis took, uh, David, uh, David Lewis took Mao to a planetarium at the Bishop Museum before he sailed uh, the Hokulea to Tahiti so that uh, Mao could learn the stars and chart his course and use his knowledge to, to reach landfall, wayfinding to, to uh, Tahiti. So it's a very good example of thinking 
in terms of being in a planetarium, and, this, and it's a polydimensional system whereby you don't move, but everything moves around you. You, like I said, you have to think differently. It's a different way of thinking. So when you're a planetarium, you see the stars come up, they come down, but you're sitting in your seat, just like you're on a canoe. So this is how uh, Mao Pilaluk studied the stars in the southern horizon to, to understand where to go. Okay, so Ali, you want to, this, this map, this chart was made in uh, 1909 by Aaron Surford on Poluwat. There are several other ones like this, I won't go into it because we only have 10 minutes, but David Lewis has done a lot of work on this, Thomas Gladwin, these are the seminal anthropologists who really have described the system. I've studied with Ali, trying to understand it myself. We, I spent 2013 uh, sailing, uh, going on the ship from Yap to Lamatrek, specifically to, to understand this system. The important thing to remember is that this is in conflict, this traditional system of navigation is in conflict with GPS. Why? Because GPS is the trend. And it's so difficult for navigators to learn this, they have to voyage. You cannot do it from books. You have to get out on the ocean. There's no other way. That's one reason why I'm sailing back with Ali after the fest back to Lamatrek so I can refine my understanding of it. So Ali, why don't you Before I proceed, I would like first to thank, thank you all for allowing us to come up here and share a little bit on our knowledge in the traditional navigation. Also, I would like to pay my respect to Sai, all these uh, relatives of mine who are among you here. We're all from same place. I mean, we're just in one family. It goes to also, I would like to thank Cesario for showing up, who is, in our custom, there is no such thing like a cousin, but we call them brothers, who is, his father is my brother, I call brother, because we were like both uh, sons of my father. That's why they are called my sons. And so, <clears throat> I am an advocate of the traditional navigation. And if I am an advocate, I really want it to work the way it is. To say, wayfinding, I have to do it on myself without the help of any modern navigational equipment. Because I think if we have to practice, I mean, keep on using a GPS, then there is advantage of that and there is disadvantage of the GPS. The advantage of it is, you know, it's more better, very fast, very accurate. You can just take off and look for where you're going. The disadvantage of it is, what if you go out right in the open sea where you don't see land anymore and you capsize or the satellite shuts down? How would you find land? That's why the traditional knowledge of navigation is much better based on learning the attack between islands, your point of departure, for example here, leaving follow up for Chuk, and their reference island is Pesarat. So these are the attack. While going here, when you leave Pulot, you set a reference island, and then Chuk to the reference island. So when you're sailing this way, what star, this reference island lies under from Chu 
and also your destination, what star does your reference island lies under from your destination island. So moving here, you start moving, the eta goes this way. So when you move up here, you have to count, knowing it, estimating it in your head. Okay, now that I'm moving here, and then when this departure island disappear, you know, okay, I probably cut one star line, which is I already finished one attack. Yeah. So meaning the reference island is moving from the star where it is from Pulot and then go back up here. So you know now, now it's moving here under this star. And then you take about the length of when you leave from here and it disappear, you call it one, then estimate how long you continue on, then okay, now two. So it's all estimate and calculation on yourself, moving that. Because the reference island tells you your position at its time. So it doesn't matter if you don't have the GPS, you still know where you are at its time. And also make sure that you have to observe this island, the departure island, before it disappears from your side. Because this will tell you where you are heading, whether the current is coming, pushing from this way or that way. Because if you're drifting up here, then that means both islands are moving down. So you're the one who is going like this in between them. Now, Take into the consideration the fact of the wind direction. Where is the wind coming from? So you also have to think about that. So you know where to point to, to make sure that you don't miss your target. But when your calculation is up that you know you're, you're already supposed to see this island, but you don't see land, then it is always, there's a saying that we always say, it is always good to extend your attack, make it long then one more. Now, when you know that there's no island, you always have to look back, you know where to go. So there's no worry about that. We don't worry when we said. I, I just like to encourage you that it doesn't matter where you go, you don't have to be scared. Because, you know, every time when you're a navigator, it, you, it looks like you're sleeping, but you don't really sleep. You know, you're on the canoe, calculating, calculating, estimating things, listening to the waves hitting your canoe so you know where the canoe is pointing to. Because even if you close your eyes, you know that the course is altered by the sound on the side of the canoe. And you can always change. Nighttime when you see the stars, same thing, even though you lie face up, you know that the course is out, the canoe is out of course. Because you just check from the stars above. So, I think I'm not talking about anybody, but I just like to encourage all navigators to make sure that we should stay on the way we learn traditional navigation. We should not really adapt this GPS stuff because it won't help us. It won't, I'm sure of that. Only if that thing is running very nice. And only if you don't lost it in the open sea. Because remember that there is something that might happen, all satellite shuts down, where, where are we going? We end up uh, probably somewhere else. So it is always good to have the traditional way of na navigation. Wayfinding. There is always a saying that they say, way of the wayfinder. So we have to make sure that we stay with that. I'm happy if I do navigation like that rather than being sailing with these modern things. And 
what I always mention to the guys who wants to sail with me. Say, Whoever brings out GPS on my canoe, that means you guys will have to stay back. I'm not sailing. So I don't want them to do that to me. And so they did it. And let me just share one small story about my first cousin. His name is uh, Ramoy, who just died about, I don't know, two years ago. And so they were sailing for Piccolot. And his younger brother had a GPS with him. And so he put it out trying to find out where they're heading, whether they're heading straight to pick a load or what. And Romoy was resting and he heard the commotion. So he got up. What are you guys doing? And they said, oh, no, we're looking at the GPS because uh, this, is, this thing is very accurate. You can tell us our position. So he said, oh, I love that. Can you give me? I want to check it. So instead of thinking, they just give the GPS to him. Well, that throw in the water. <laughs> and that's it. So I think that we should, well, say we are islanders, and that is our equipment, only the head, to think about everything, to memorize everything so we won't depend on other stuff. So I thank you all, and that's about it. Uh, we're not finished. We're not finished, but. Do we have more time, Vince? Because we want to relate this to uh, the post-ceremony. Okay. So, um, what is the best? The challenge is how to safeguard this knowledge. There, Urupi performed post-ceremony on Lamatrek in 1990. Another one, two were performed on Pulawat and Punap in 1997. Another one on Punap in 2000. I've been to two or three of those, then another one on Pulawat. So the post-ceremony has become a trend, but the post-ceremony has become more or less an honorary degree. It's not. It, ritually, it was used for instruction, not only in navigational and te uh, techniques, over four days, should take place over four days, and in that process, the students are instructed, they're tested, and then they are initiated. Then they have to sail to a test island to prove that they can do it. But beyond the techniques, there's this spiritual aspect of it. To have the guts to do it, you have to learn the chants. Now, every culture can adapt the post ceremony, but it, what I'm telling you is that what is happening now with the post ceremony is not correct. I'm sorry, hasaro. Yami, one day, not good enough. Two days, not good enough. The students need to go through a course of study and be recognized. That, and the challenge is to pay the teachers and give scholarships to students to further the knowledge because that's the only way the ETOC system is going to be preserved and safeguarded. In YAP, Ali was uh, teaching his students last year. Uh, the legislature of YAP gave money to pay him to, uh, for nine months, and then at the end of that, he inducted his students into the post-ceremony, I was there. So that is a formal schooling process. It's the only formal schooling process that exists now that is similar to the Western schooling process, and if one has funding, one can advance the furtherment of, of preserving the ETOC system as well as the post-ceremony done correctly to instruct students, just like they're going to college, and giving them scholarships to do so, because the students, if they don't have money, they're, they're going to have to have work for their families. Okay, thank you very much. I really appreciate your attention. Grandmaster Ali was talking about in saying that uh, Hold on to your, your, your tradition. This is why you still have it. Now, you know, for us, uh, I was lucky enough that um, 
Naimel Thompson came to Micronesia to look for Mao. And Mao, against um, the traditions of his culture, shared your secrets to Nainoa. And then Nainoa passed it on to the rest of uh, Polynesia, to people like myself and Jacko Hotu and many, many others. So I just want to say thank you very much uh, to all of you uh, for, for holding on to your dream. It's very, very powerful. And um, you know, for learning the navigation, I was able to, to meet a lot of very good people. I met with uh, Cesario a long time ago. Uh, he was small, he's getting smaller again. And I had black hair. And, uh, but we went through a lot of uh, struggles, a lot of training with uh, Papa Mao and with Nainoa and many of the other navigators in Hawaii to, to learn the navigation again. And um, um, I'm from the Cook Islands. Of course, you all know Cook Islands was discovered by Captain Cook. <laughs> when he got there, the people he saw was just part of the furniture. But uh, I'm from the Cook Islands, and uh, my name is Tua. And I started voyaging uh, a long time ago when I was, I'm not going to tell you how old I was, but this is my home. Very, in 1995 I was on Hokulea, you can tell where I am. I'm the guy with the uh, black hair. And I had to show you this photo so that you know I did have black hair one time. Not like Cesario. And um, I started on Hokulea, when Hokulea came to the Cook Islands. And then uh, we had our own canoe, uh, Te Otonga, uh, which we sailed from the Cook Islands on up into uh, Hawaii and then around the Pacific um, many, many years ago. Um, our canoe was a, was a replica of a canoe that used to come down from, the, from eastern Polynesia through the Cook Islands and down, I'm mean, sorry, from Western through and then uh, across to the East and it's a Tipailua from the Tuamotu Islands. Um, our canoe is 72 feet long and uh, very, very fast. Cesare and I, and I sailed on this canoe from the Cook Islands to Mururoa, the island that the Pacific Island people, I mean the, the French were bombing. So we went there to protest against the bomb. The funny thing was, they, uh, when they came, when, when we were sailing to Mururo, the French were following us in uh, stealth mode. They turned, all the engine, they turned all their lights off and all we could hear behind us was this big frigate with his gun pointed at the... They didn't worry about any of the other yachts, but they were scared of the Pacific Island people because we're crazy people, right? <laughs> they scared we were going to go straight up onto the beach and do something to their stuff. So, in the morning when the big ship came past our, our, our canoe, all of the French men were standing there with their big guns and they're pointing and they're keeping an eye on us. And as the ship went past, three decks down, right at the back, all the chefs and the cooks and the, the boys that cleaned the deck were all Tahitians. They're at the back of the ship going... <laughs> Pacific Island power! Okay, back to the subject. <laughs> so now we have our, our canoe, Marumaru Atua, uh, which is part of the fleet of the same canoes that Hotu has and what uh, Matahi has in the Pacific. And we try to keep our canoes together as much as possible so that Polynesia never loses the knowledge that we gained from Micronesia. Um, and I, I strongly feel, you know, it's because of these two, these two gentlemen here. Mao and Nainoa, they came and they shared the knowledge with us. Um, you know, I would probably be a different man if I hadn't met these gentlemen here. I'd be raking the rubbish at home somewhere or something like that. 
So um, we were able to sail across the ocean and then, see, we learned the same thing. You know, the, uh, the, the compass that everybody learns. Um, and we use this very, this, the very same principle of memorizing the star compass in our minds and referencing the stars um, rising and setting in the east, rising in the east and setting in the west. Same thing, same concept. The Itak, we haven't perfected yet, so I have to come and live with you until I have no hair. <laughs> and forget about what the GPS says. But same concept, we use, the, use this compass to, uh, to get us to where we need to go. Opportunities of, what opportunities can we get out of, uh, of voyaging? Um, we're learning a lost skill, which we've, we've done so far. We, we started off with only one, nav well, no navigators in Polynesia. We ended up with one, Manuel Thompson. He shared, now we had, and then we had uh, around 10, 12 navigators. Now from those 12, we've gone on to about 30 navigators in Polynesia, so. And that's because of you. Everything comes back to you. And everything you know goes back to our ancestors. Back to the ball. Uh, it's still a sense of, uh, of a voyaging pride. I don't know if I spelled it still properly. But it's being proud of voyaging. This is the opportunities you have, is to be able to get out there and show the rest of the world that the Pacific Ocean is not a place to be scared of, if you know enough about it. Yes. And uh, for us, it's allowing the Cook Islands to reconnect our ancestry and genealogies with others through voyaging. You know, from our island, we go to another island like Aotearoa, to New Zealand, and we, rec we reconnect not just what we know about voyaging and about navigation, but our blood ties, our, our blood ties. See, when I walked into this room today, and I saw all these gentlemen standing here, I'd never met them before, but I'd met them before. Because of what we go through and what we know, and at one time, our ancestors were all in the same place, on the same canoe, doing what we're doing now. And the opportunities we have with our canoes is aligning with environmental and conservational uh, institutes. So we're able to not only talk about our culture, but we can also talk about our community and the way we can look after our land the way we can look after our ocean and uh, keep our world alive. It's, you know, the, I, the Earth is an island as well, which is what Hokule is doing right now. It's sailing around island Earth to highlight all the issues that we have in the Pacific. And if uh, anybody's going to be able to tell the story, it's us, because people look up to voyagers, they look up to the canoe, they identify what the canoe stands for. Once they get interested in the canoe and then they see that the canoe people are talking about these issues of environment and conservation, they will start to change their mindset. Challenges, cost. In our world, where we come from, it's all about how much is it going to cost to do something. Um, in Polynesia, we have our canoes. Yes, it's great. We can get a lot of people on them. Fantastic. But we sail, um, when we have the opportunity to go out and teach the young ones, we sail if there's an event somewhere. The difference is with Micronesia, you sail because that's your life. This is what you do. You sail because you have to get from one island to another island. You have to go to your fishing grounds, you have to go and look for turtle, you have to go and pick up drums of petrol to take to other islands. You're there, it's your life, you live it. For us, we do this whenever we have the opportunity to. Time, everybody has to go to work, everybody has to have a job, everybody has to get paid. And these are the challenges we face. Um, you can have a beautiful canoe, but if there's nobody on board to sail it, then it's not gonna go anywhere. Because people need to provide for their families. These are challenges, right? Maintenance, of course, we have to the upkeep of canoes and keeping them going. And immigration. 
people are leaving our islands and going to the big smoke and we're left with the very young and the very old so there's no one there to to sail these canoes so you know when i get on this big 72 foot canoe i'm steering and pulling the sail at the same time and trying to navigate because there's no one around they've all gone so these are these are the challenges that we have and uh, Again, if it wasn't for this gentleman, um, we wouldn't be here today. And I, I'm just, uh, I'm so happy to, to, to see that uh, Antonio was here and Cesario's here and you're here as well. And then little Dylan, one day Dylan's going to be the one standing up here telling us the story. And I'm going to be the old man in the back there eating the food. <laughs> the canoe is about pulling the people together. We need to get together more. Um, and I'd like to, to thank uh, UNESCO at this time for, for pulling us together. Um, if, if they hadn't step, stuck with the program that they have right now, um, we wouldn't have this, this gathering. And, and I think it's very, very important that we keep doing this. And thank you very much, UNESCO. Please uh, go back and, and, and tell the powers that be that we really, really appreciate what you're doing to keep our culture alive. Thank you very much. But we need to connect with our communities. Look what the canoe does. It pulls people together. Hokulea went out and told the story. Um, the other voyage, when we went to the Solomon Islands, we pulled the people together through our canoes. And then we do that through our culture. We keep our culture together. We share the stories orally, because we didn't have a written culture at that time. We uh, align ourselves, we take all our people together and we sail as one big family to tell the story of what's going on in our islands. And then we come to Guam and there you are. You're all sailing in as one family. We're all sailing in together. And you're letting them know who you are. It was beautiful and I thank uh, Guam for pulling all the Micronesian canoes together and sailing them in so that the people can see how brave and how strong and how knowledgeable you are. I'm just privileged to be able to be here. And uh, Hotu and I were able to, to sail in. Um, Sandy and your group from the... You guys down the back there? From Tassa? Thank you so much for allowing me to be on your canoe. I know once I got on, we almost took water on board. But we could have thrown some of the heavier guys off. <laughs> So thank you very much, and I, I just leave you with this uh, little clip. This is uh, the canoe that I have in, uh, we have in, in Rotokonga, and um, I just wanted to, to be able to share this with you, so you can see uh, what we use. But then, you know, the bigger the canoe, the harder it is to get the crew members on there to get it around. But once we do have uh, the canoe in the water, she does very, very well. And uh, I just want to share with uh, the gentleman that came up earlier to talk about Taiwan. And um, I'd like one day for our canoes to all sail together back to where our origin is. Because um, I was just sharing with Danny earlier that It'd be good to go back and show the people of Taiwan how their DNA ended, look, ended up looking like. I said, this here is your DNA. And they can have a look at the comparison. Thank you very much. Two other people that I've gotten to know in the fields of academic conferencing uh, we're going to share um, the work that they've done with it. Uh, so Sandra Morrison, who teaches at Waikato, uh, will talk a little bit about the process of translating this into Maori, and, and, uh, and her colleague, uh, Dr. Timothy Violetti, also from Waikato, uh, of Tongan ancestry, will talk about the same thing uh, with re regard to Tongan language. Koto e pupuri nei ki te mano o tinei whinua. Koto ngā pukinga e puki 
i pipuri nei ki te mano o te moana, a kanoi ngā mahi ki a koutou i roto i te wairua o tō tātou rangatira, ko wehe ki te pō, nō reira whaere i te rangatira moe mai rā. Tātou ngā kanohi ora, te ngā koutou, te ngā koutou, te ngā tātou katō. Good afternoon, and I'm aware you've all been sitting for a very long time. Um, as I was introduced, I'm Sandy Morrison. I'm from the tribes of Tainui and Te Arua in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, I'll allow my colleague to introduce himself and then we'll talk about the resource. Back in 2007, we worked with the local indigenous knowledge systems called LINX from UNESCO in Paris. Their job is to ensure that their cultural treasures are passed on to future generations in the formal education system. And so they worked with us at the University of Waikato, Hotero Kerr was a staff member then, and they sent down people to document and go around the Pacific to take small video clips about traditional navigation. So within this resource, we have a, a CD-ROM that has got Papa Mao, Nainoa Thompson, Tua Hotero, and many others, Doris from the Cook Islands as well, who have shared their stories and traditions on the CD-ROM. And then in addition to that, uh, there they are there, the people we worked with, I'll come back to that. In addition to that, what was then asked was for a teacher's manual to be drawn up. Um, so I guess we're coming from the perspective of turning your knowledge into a curriculum that will excite the future generations. And that's a very hard job when you've got to talk about developing the curriculum. Uh, what started out as a six month project turned into two years because this original resource was written in English and it didn't actually capture all of those spiritual dimensions that we've heard you talk about. And then the third part of that was to translate this into the Māori language for Māori medium schools throughout Aotearoa. We've had the English version for a while and school teachers and our young people who have come through Māori medium schooling asked that this be translated into the Māori language. So we've got two weeks to go of our two-year project and then it's finished. It's just under quality assurance right now. Um, this is our team. Uh, we've had a head translator. We've had Pacific and curriculum advice from Dr Violetti, who will talk soon. We had uh, a young person involved to capture how young people learn and to keep us conscientised to their learning needs. Uh, they've been part of our team right along. And what this consists of, as I said before, we have a teacher's manual that has specific exercises. It's in five or six chapters. It has learning outcomes as well. You can also go on the net and download the whole resource here. Uh, and so we, we have brought hard copies here with our friends from UNESCO, Dr Akatsuki over here and Dr Alain from the up here office as well. Um, and so we do have some copies for you, but just before we... Um, we talk more about it. I'll ask Dr. Violetti to talk about some of the challenges that we had, um, and then we'll come back. Yeah, thank you, us. Sandy. Um, ko hai yau, ko e mai. I stand here and I think about Ron Concrombie, the late Professor Crombie, 
uh, when he talked about the employment trend of people from Tonga, and there was something that he said that fascinated him. And when you ask Tongans, uh, where do captains come from? He, you know, they would say, funny enough, they come from the islands of Hawaii, but more than that, they come from just one village. Further than that, they come from just one family. So I stand here as one of those who descended from that family, and I'm here with my identity, which is Sayo. And when you see Tongans, they tie their waka around them. They don't leave them behind. In fact, their houses are waka turned upside down. Not only that, but they build them in such a way so when the wind comes in, they go around them like a waka and escape the other way. So we do not leave our waka because that's our motu, it's our island. So we tie our whenua or whenua around us if you're from Hapai. So that's who I am. But I won't be here, I'm not here to talk about that, I'm talk, I will talk about the project. There was a challenge because often you would agree with me that if Christianity did not use the Roman Empire as a vehicle to have the tradition and the religion spread, it would be one of those very small religious sects still maybe in the Middle East. So our challenge is because these wonderful stories and knowledge that we have, how do we make sure that the earth and the world will keep it on? I suggest that we look at schools as a powerful vehicle to make sure it is never lost. So, but it was very difficult to try and make this make sense to the people and the schools because they come from a slightly different epistemology, a thinking system which is based on science and rationality. How do you prove that? But this is a really the best instrument because we can prove to people that our knowledge will. But really, it is a challenge because you know, knowledge comes, power creates knowledge. And resistant to knowledge creates power as well. So really, it's reformatting our way in a way that you know, uh, young people can identify with. But what we want to actually say to them, like somebody was talking about the two-dimensional travel, you can go from one point to the other but you miss everything else that's around it, okay? So really trying to teach young people that many things are happening at one time, you're not just dealing with one thing at a time, was the difficult one. We try to redesign a way that people study, but they're aware of the relationship. The va or the Samoan and the Tongan refer to as a relationship, the va. In fact, when I talk about my old people, they say, you know, vaka is about food, very basic. The va is the space between waste and land, the things that actually don't belong to people or belong to all of us. So we go to the va for our kai. So vaka is a short for va kai. So, you know, that's how it actually started. Wa, the space between islands, between people, relationship. And kai is the basic of survival. So really, it's bringing those things to the classroom there's sort of more meaning to the, to, to the learning of young people. So if I just go back to the last one, before I finish. <coughs> so really, the attack was from this here in a way that teachers can make sense of because we need to buy, get them to have a buy-in to this slightly different way of learning. And we are actually I'm mindful of the way that we're learning. Some people refer to them as kind of static time learning. We have to touch and feel. Okay, so we think about emotional learning. This knowledge was used by our ancestors. There's a certain amount of spirituality. So you think about physical learning. You do that enough in your muscle memory, you actually just learn it, so it's physical learning. Okay, if it's more meaningful to you spiritually, then it's more likely that you remember it. And the last one that I was thinking about is emotional. Okay? You feel happy that you're doing it because it's different. Young people used to do it. So there's a connection between you and the people who are, who are here. So that's the approach that we're taking. Hopefully people will take them up. The last thing I say, I really, really am happy that you're creating the knowledge that you have. But there's a saying, there's no use winking at somebody you're interested in in the dark. 
they need to know that you're interested, interested in them. So they need to actually share what has accumulated for a long, long time with our young people out there. So our job is to convert the unconverted, to spread your stories, to infiltrate the formal education system. And, and while this is a voluntary resource in New Zealand, we are seeing a large pickup of this resource because we have now, as I said, just about completed it in the Maori language. The Cook Islands Ministry, through Tua and his colleagues, have been using this resource for the, in the Cook Island language for the last um, year or so, I think, Tua. And the idea, dependent on resource, is for this resource to also be translated into other languages. For those of you who are interested, we can walk you through this resource if you have time during the break or at the end of the day, just so that we can introduce you to how it is used within the schooling system in Old Table, New Zealand. So we'll leave, um, we'll leave that for if you're interested. We do have some packs, especially for the first two rows here. We would, um, Akasuki, if you don't mind um, bringing them along to the first two rows, then after that you can request it from UNESCO or go to the um, website and download all the resources there. So koira noiho e homa. So that's all uh, to show you and introduce you work that we're doing to ensure that your knowledge is never lost. Peter Nuttles uh, quoted Datu Sekamasi Semara this morning about being the great navigators. The ending statement of Sir Datu's speech he asked, how can we honour those deeds and the ancestors of those who have left the knowledge? And for us, part of that solution lies in formulating and enhancing resources that can be used by all. Kia ora koutou katoa. And uh, we prayed for an opportunity to, uh, to begin some kind of a school, to collaborate with those who know and, uh, and bring it to Guam. Because as... Uh, Mike and Mario so eloquently described colonialism destroyed our, our lost tradition. My grandfather was a canoe builder. He built reef gliders, not, out of, not for art perpetuation, just for, not to preserve art, but to preserve our family, my mom's family, uh, for fishing in Pongo Bay. And, um, but unfortunately, that has not continued like it should. And so it's become incumbent upon us to, to, to bring it back. And so, uh, so uh, when we came back to Guam, we started a school, Southern Christian Academy in Agate. And this is a, this is a preschool through high school. Uh, but we've always had the passion to eventually open a vocational school for troubled youth, for at-risk youth. And um, we came upon this concept through collaboration with many people, educators and people, uh, to incorporate traditional navigation and seafaring in our high school curriculum. So we are the only school that incorporates traditional navigation on Guam as part of our main curriculum, not as an extracurricular, but as a high school credit. So we offer credit for teaching the art of canoe building, sailing, and, and navigation. It's in its infancy, and we started with the, uh, we formally started with the late uh, uh, Grandmaster Manny Sakao, who was gracious enough to come and teach at our school. So he taught uh, for more than a year, uh, but of course, as we know, we, as uh, the Lord took him home, he passed away. Um, we prayed, Lord, send us somebody else, another, you know, master who can teach us, and that's how we met up with Rob Limpjapla. So Rob, uh, out of his own uh, time, and I'm also, he asked me to also share on his behalf. Um, uh, unfortunately, he had to leave early, but um, he wanted to share his passion, which is really, it's the kids, like you just said, like uh, we have to hide it in our children. And, uh, and we have to do it with love. And we have to do it with a really, we have to be driven by a higher purpose uh, that, that is very deep and spiritual. And Rob is a very spiritual man and loves his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And he wants to see this not to be an antithesis to the culture, but emerging and a, a redeeming of that culture because so much has been done in the past in the name of Christ which damaged that culture. 
and it's incumbent upon us to restore it. And um, we're also, our school is also involved in decolonization. And I believe that this has a lot to do with asserting ourselves as a people through our culture and our identity. There, there is a need for restorative justice uh, because the colonizers destroyed this art and this science. And um, so we need to restore it. And uh, we pray one day Guam, when they announce Guam, it won't be uh, a territory of the United States, but it will be the Republic of Guam and, uh, or free association or state. Those are the three opportunities that the United States and the United Nations is giving our, our, our island the opportunity to decide because we have not decided our political status. And merging this with our education and navigation has everything to do with that because it's our identity. And so when they know who they are, uh, they'll know what to do. But Rob asked that um, he wanted to share that it has to be done with love and a passion for the students and the children. And again, I want to thank you, Puloa, Satoa, Lamatrek, Yap, Chuk, Palau, Marshals, uh, because you have given it to us. We are, we are getting it back through you. And we also believe that um, we have an opportunity to restore cultural divides that were caused by colonialism because before colonization, we were one people. We didn't see each other as Micronesia. There was no such thing as the term Micronesia. In fact, they should call it Macronesia because our, our ocean is so big. <laughs> And so um, we believe that this has, we have an opportunity to make things right in the past because my mother and my grandmother were told that uh, they were punished for speaking tomorrow. And um, they were also taught this prejudice about dark color. And uh, this is part of the reason why my mom said, oh, my grandmother told my mom, marry a white person because they're better. This was the kind of attitude that was inculcated by uh, colonization. They gave them this complex. And so the Chamorros turned around and did the same thing to other people. And it's a terrible part of our history that there was, we had a, at one time there was a Carolinian community on Guam before the war. But because of shame and uh, because of, uh, of policies, they were driven out from Tamuni. In fact, the village Tamuni is, is a Carolinian word, Tamurgi. And it's, it's from the people that were there. What a gift they were to us that we could have learned and we could have continued the, the knowledge of seafaring had we not driven to th them away. And so on behalf of my father's people and uh, my mother's people and my father's people, uh, I apologize. And we want to make it right. And we want to build bridges to restore it. And this whole thing that uh, the islands look to west for support, that the islands look to the west, that the islands look to um, uh, the colonizer for inspiration is reverse. We're, we want to turn it around and say, no, we're looking to you. We're looking to you because we're the ones who are lost. We're the ones who are bereft. We're the ones who are in need. And we thank you for inspiring us and giving us these gifts. You don't have to. You can keep it hidden. Uh, like uh, in the way your culture is supposed to, but you've chosen to share it with us. And for that, we are so grateful. Our God is great. And uh, I just have to put in one plug. Our seafarers need marine epoxy. <laughs> they need, if you know anybody, if you can pull any strings, uh, coral reef is sold out, ship ride is sold out, and if there's anything that can come out of this conference is to find two gallons of marine epoxy. <laughs> Am I right? They need, uh, Ali needs marine epoxy to repair his boat and to fix the rudder. And so we need fiberglass, marine epoxy, and hardener. Remember, it's two part. <laughs> Good night. It's sold out, but we need their help. Falosnia, our purpose is to train students and youth and rebuild uh, um, the culture, and uh, we are doing it through. Uh, we are doing this through collaborating with our families, our the Puloa community, and any other community that's helping us. Of course, we need funding, but uh, 
Our long-term goal is sustainable employment. We are going to provide jobs for these students in maritime science, not just in traditional navigation, but as captains in our tourist, tourist industry. So that's the long-term uh, goal of Losnia at Southern Christian Academy. So thank you for your time. This next person I want to ask up is uh, someone who late last night and I was thinking about who are we missing? Who do we have to hear from who was not on the list? Um, he came to mind. He's one of these guys who are behind the scenes, who has actually been extremely important for the livelihood and safety of practically every navigator and voyage that I know of in the past 20, maybe 30 years. Uh, his name is Bruce Best. Bruce has laid down and has handled the communications network on the ground that when a voyager or a ship or a canoe is lost or that allows the atolls to speak to each other, this is the guy that, that is the go-to. And you can see him during the fest pack running around making sure that the coolers for all of our seafarers have water and is filled with ice. I've asked Bruce to come up because there's nobody else better prepared and more knowledgeable about the needs on the ground and on the sea for the seafarers. Half a day. Our friends from the Marshalls. Piorana, Piora, Bonjour, our friends down south. It's a great honor to be here with all you. Yes, I have been working with the Micronesian navigators for the last 30, 35 years, nearly 40 years now. Thanks to uh, Robert Underwood, he's put up with me at the university, allowed me to go out and do that. He said, as long as you don't get me in trouble, and number two, you find your own money. He said, grant writing is a big part of supporting the islands because we live in fish and coconuts out here, so we're not, you know, I have to find money to support the seafaring community, the wayfinders. Ever since the early 70s when McCoy, Mike McCoy found, they started developing their tradition with the canoes in Hawaii. Different design, of course, double hold, as Maizu is a product of, from the Makali group in the Big Island. Mao used to come through then. All of a sudden, you see a lot more of them. Instead of just in Saipan, Sadawa, when I go down there, I always hang with him. And uh, he stays at my house here in Guam when he's passing back through, catching the plane from Hawaii back to Saipan or something. We had a lot of long, long conversations. Long for Mao is like six words. <laughs> On a good day, you might wait a week for another conversation. So you kind of have to live with him for a while to get trained, as I know him. Chad and Clay Bertelman and the rest of them did. So they picked up the, the navigation skills. And a lot of you in this room don't understand how big a thing that was, the taboo of bring, letting the outside know those secrets. It's a major turning point. Culture is what we have now. Tradition is what we're trying to maintain. I always had the discussion with Papa. He'd look at my house. I had big, big wood, carved wood, and, you know, it's, it's just a big giant, I'm Kalakas, basically. So it's this typhoon country, I'm building wood houses. And he's, why do you build it so heavy duty? Well, I want it to last a while, you know, my kids can, you know, get it. And he says, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard. If you build something that lasts more than one generation, how are you gonna carry on the tradition? Thatched huts, canoes. Your kids have to learn how to build canoes. Cesario and uh, his son is a good example. He said, it's, you guys have a total different perspective on life. You had to respect the guy. Communications in the Outer Islands is one of the biggest uh, challenges we have. For you guys, yesterday I taught a four-hour class to all the Micronesian weather station men. They're all here for a, a month. Graduations on Sunday where they didn't learn how to forecast. Weather is a big problem for us. And I know when he traveled through in Hukalea and all the Makali trips, they are on the radio every day. Bruce. What's going on? And I'd give him the forecast, five-day forecast, four-day forecast. You had to be very careful because you can't tell them 
the forecast for where you think he is, or actually some of them with the find me spots now, they can track. They don't know where they are, but they send a signal up and they get a little track once in a while. So you have to be careful, not give them general weather. You can't tell them where he's at. He knows where he's at. We don't lose canoes. As we said, I do a lot of search and rescue for the Coast Guard. I run a daily network. I do news and weather for 68 outer islands. Then I have to find money, go out there and build their radios for health and education, maintain all those systems. Even Ollie, back when the first canoe came up on the uh, shore at Pirate's Cove, Marie was smart enough that she found me out of the bush somewhere, and she says, I need these little solar-powered communication things that we can work on canoes. So I've been designing these little boxes for years. There's lots of things we can do. If we can find continued cash flow, I mean, writing proposals, great. I can kind of keep the solar-powered communication networks going. It's all HF radio. Uh, we don't have internet out in those outer islands. That's a social, cultural consideration. That's a whole other story. So we have lots of papers on that. But we have to, to be sure our islands survive. The way of life is preserved. It allows traditional navigation and traditional seafaring and wayfinder. Sea level's rising. They don't have breadfruits growing as fast as they do before because salt water's inundated the ground. My islands out here in Micronesia are not going to overflow with water. They're going to starve to death long before that. Taro plants now are getting hard. As soon as the way on a bright sunny day like this, on a big wave day, moon, tides, everything comes together. The waves go across the berm and into the taro patch. Salt and water and taro don't do well. So we have a food problem. We have a food security problem. Breadfruits aren't so common anymore. That's why we're looking for epoxy. By the way, a bonded material sells three different viscosities of epoxy, so might be able to get by with that in a pinch. Not quite marine, but will work. So we've got to try to think about the global situation in Micronesia. Uh, sea level rising is just one of them, climate change, but we are at the tip of that poison spear. Marshall Islands is an atoll nation. There is no high islands. Highest elevation in the whole country, and there's I, I support like 30, 40 outer islands in the Marshall. The highest, even in Masro, it's about this high. After Saturday night behind the bar, it might be this high, but it goes down during the rest of the week. We don't have a lot of choices out here. The Marshall Islands, for you that follow that, is very interesting. She spoke, uh, the Jetnel, Hilda, Heine's uh, daughter, just amazing women. She spoke at the United Nations concert on climate change in, in New York, told a poem. The bottom line is, they're not leaving. They don't want to leave. Everybody says, where are you going to go? Kiribati, Tuvalu, places down south. They've got to find a home soon because it's almost over the top. But Marshall says, they got to figure this out. We got to start helping them with their agriculture. We got to start building raised gardens. Put a, put a tarp in it. I do Christmas drop every year and I drop to 68 and 70 islands with supplies. We got to give them seeds, soil. Not a lot of dirt on an atoll. You know, we don't have fruits and vegetables growing because it's just not enough dirt. If we can start raising gardens, put taro plants in there as seed crops, when the water does get high, let it rain for a while, it washes out the salt, then we replant. We've got to start thinking. We've got to be more innovative. If we want to preserve our islands, to be able to preserve the wayfinding. I have lots of stuff on communication. Uh, it's a long two-week course. In fact, I'll be going there in a couple months through all the main islands, the six islands of Micronesia, four states, two republics. And I give talks to all the schools and dispensaries, all the leaders and administrators on what's going on now for their islands and what's coming up in the future for telecommunication. As most of you know, we don't have a lot of options. We don't. Some satellites shut off when they go across their area. VHF. CB radio is still one of the most common voyaging packages. It's, you know, it's, you don't, it's hard to, Radio Shack doesn't exist anymore out here in Guam. It's hard to get handheld CBs. But it goes a little farther than VHF. How do you charge it? You build little kits. We almost were able to preserve a lot of the, I do a lot of search and rescue with these boats. They don't, they're not the canoes. They're the ones with motors trying to go 125 miles because there is no more transportation. A real good film back there, the Papua New Guinea. Put a bunch of canoes together and build like a large canoe, like a double hull, but it has like four canoes strapped together. We need cargo carrying vessels 
that don't take me $90,000. That's what it cost me to fill up the micro spirit or the Voyager or the Navigator, the new boat. China's giving us boats. We can't afford to put fuel in them. We need a boat with a mast on it. These people out here know how to do that. They can repair it. They can sail it. They can keep it going. And you can run a small outboard motor on coconut oil. You don't need outside materials if you start thinking that, thinking rationally for the future because our local resources aren't going to be there. We're not going to be able to ask somebody to bring a cargo boat out to bring in supplies for all our islands. We're going to have to do it ourselves. Small sailing canoes is the answer. Transportation is the answer. Communication is a tool that we use to talk, but if I can't get stuff to them, all I can do is talk to them. I can't send them medicine. I can't get their teachers trained. I can't get their patients back into the hospital. So the transportation is the key. Seafaring is the solution. Let's all help for a better Micronesia, better Pacific. Long live the navigators. Our final speaker is um, Pete Paris. Pete is with, uh, I introduced him very briefly, but he's from Saipan, and, uh, and I'll have him share with you information about his, his organization and his vision that I think is, is a fantastic one. Half a day. Um, Half a day. Very good. In, um, in the year 1565, the San Pedro arrived on, off of Guam, and when those Spaniards arrived, they were greeted by Chamorros in their canoes. And they were escorted in, and they dropped their anchor, and the Chamorros kept coming, and they kept coming, and they kept coming. They were coming from all over. The word got around. And the people on board uh, San Pedro counted them. And they wrote this in their logs, and that log survives. And they said, they kept coming all day until we looked around us, and there were four or 500 Chamorro Proas. So my organization is called 500 Sales. And the goal of 500 Sales is to put 500 Chamorro Proas on the water again by the year 2030. Um, it, 2030 is right around the corner, um, but how do you do something like that? Uh, how do you build that many pros in such a short time? I was involved uh, with the Tetler organization that, that built um, Tetler, 47 feet, made out of a Mendocino redwood log. Took a year to build and about $30,000. So you're not going to build 500 pros at $30,000 a pop. It's not possible. Another thing that happens is, that is happening is that people wait and they wait and they wait for a chance to participate. And it doesn't come because it just takes too long to build a proa. So how do you get to 500 proas? And the answer is fiberglass. Now fiberglass is, uh, it goes against every grain in my body to build something fiberglass and say that it's traditional. It, it just, I should say it did, but it doesn't anymore because the Chamorro Pro is an invention of the Chamorro people. They, they had that for 4,000 years. That's how they arrived. It is an engineering marvel. Just like all the pros in Micronesia are engineering marvels, and they're based on years and years of experience and trial and error and improvement. Regardless of what it's made of, a pro has a certain shape. It has a certain way of being uh, sailed. It, it has a purpose. It has history. So who cares what it's made out of? Um, if we can get... 500 pros on the water again, who cares what they're made of? <laughs> so, so what I did when we finished Settler, Settler was very important because that was, that was our chance to build one based on the 1742 drawing that was made when the Centurion arrived in, in Tinian. And it is an authentic drawing made by a nautical draftsman of that era and people in the 1700s knew how to build ships. They knew how to draw them, they knew how to draw a blueprint. So that is a very reliable drawing. So we have Settler out there built according to that specification. So. We had to build that first proa, and it's done. But now it's time to get proas in the hands of, of the kids and ourselves. It's time to get people out on the water, experiencing what their ancestors experienced, knowing the joy of sailing in a proa built with their own hands, feeling the wind, feeling the pull on the, on the lines, you know, feeling the thing uh, jump in the waves. Those days, um, those were wonderful days. And if you read the old, the old writings, uh, the eyewitness um, 
writings of the old the old days, people were out on the water all the time, and it was men and women and children. Even when Magellan arrived and uh, and did the atrocity that he committed, he was chased five miles out to sea by proas. And there were women, and they were crying. They were pulling their hair out for the men that had been killed, the people that had been killed. You know, the, when the when Magellan left, they broadsided the village. And they killed people with crossbows. It was like a, just a horrible, horrible first introduction to the Western world. So what I'm trying to get at here is that we, as Chamorros, and I'm half Chamorro, half Swedish, <laughs> but we're seafaring people. And when, the, when we lost that tradition, a part of our soul was ripped out. And it is a wound that has, that has carried to this day. It, it hurts me to know that all over Oceania there were people with, that still have canoes and we don't have a canoe. Right? And now I'm speaking from when I first got involved in this and, and I have to pause to acknowledge Mal Bjellek brought me, like so many other people, into this. Because when he arrived in Saipan, I learned about that and I got involved. And that's when I started questioning, well, where's our prose? I mean, where's our tradition? And I started realizing how much of our history is a fraud, how many lies were told to us about, about where we come from. You know, when the Spanish came and they, they did that, they, they, replaced, um, they replaced a whole society. They replaced our religion with religion because they didn't feel ours had a right to exist. So we're going to heal that, and we're going to do it by building 500 pros. So the way this works is we have a canoe house on Saipan. It's in Susupi. Um, I'm having repairs done to the roof. It's uh, given to us for three years by the Department of Lands and Natural Resources. And um, it's a very simple building. And in this building, we're going to build a big table. We're going to have two tables, and they'll both support building uh, up to a 50-foot proa. Um, each table could do two proas, so you could have four going simultaneously. Um, we have a process to build a proa that was designed by a, someone named Derek Kelsall, who invented this process of building with polyester, where you have fiberglass that is, um, it, that is infused with polyester, and it goes around closed cell polyester panels. And under two atmospheres of pressure, you create an extremely hard hull. And this is a modern process that's used for building yachts. So what will happen here is that if somebody wants a proa, they come and they talk to us. And we'll interview them, and we'll find out why do you want a proa. You know, what, see if they're really interested in having a proa. That's the first thing. And then find out where you're going to keep it. And make sure they have a way to keep that proa. And, and if they qualify, we will give them a proa at cost or, at, or it will be free because we can build a 25-foot proa that is solid that can go to the, to the Northern Islands, 25 feet for about $3,000. So, um, and when we do this, we do a number of things. We get people back on the water. We teach them history. We teach them boating safety. We have a, 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 a swimming program right now. We're teaching adults to swim, local people to swim three days a week. Um, and we teach them how to build a proa with fiberglass. We teach them how to repair a proa with fiberglass. The Saipan is a multicultural place. We also have Carolinians, Rafalawash people, who have another kind of proa, as we all know. We're building those too. And anybody who wants a proa is welcome. So that's the 500 sale program. That's a concept. And the, the idea is not just for Saipan, but to have a, a, a canoe house on Guam, on Tinian, on Rota and uh, San Diego. Um, by the way, we built a 25-foot hull. The people who built uh, Tetlu came up to my house in San Francisco before we moved here, and we built a 25-foot tomorrow flying for a hull, so we know we can do it. But um, anyway, that's my, that's my spiel. Sorry, I don't have anything to show you, but I wasn't really expecting to speak. So, see you Masi. We've heard from Navigators and seafarers, captains, scholars, organizers, um, and I want to uh, ask you to join me in another round of applause for all of them. <laughs> One more time for the organizers, UNESCO, uh, Judy Flores, Sandy, and other people on the ground who made this happen, and of course our crew volunteers who fed us. I don't have any profound words to close. Uh, maybe that we don't close. We, we have people here 
we have the resources to put a directory together. Uh, we decided over the, uh, the break that we'll set up a Facebook page of this group and ask all of you to join and then to like and then to set it around. There we'll have a virtual community, right? We, uh, the, I don't know what we'll call it yet, but it'll be something that reflects all of this. We'll have pictures. Um, I think most of all, this is the start of a process of, um, of taking the project of safeguarding the traditions to the next level in, in, in really formalized, systematic, thoughtful ways. The only other thing that's left is that there's still a lot of food for you to take with you. And one more, if you're um, appreciative of this forum, there's a questionnaire in your, in your, um, your, your folder, or if you can run back there and get one. I know our funders and organizers will be very, very glad, uh, happy to have that kind of feedback. I kind of want to ask Ben to, to close this with a song or two. Ben has also written a song with uh, Tatasi from San Diego.